Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is part one of chapter three, African Vampires in the Age of Globalization. From various parts of sub-Saharan Africa today come unsettling tales of vampires and zombies and of extraordinary intercourse between the living and the dead. A whole slew of folk tales spanning oral culture, videos, and pulp fiction depicts processes of magical accumulation that traverse the world of the occult. In Nigeria, newspapers carry reports of passengers on motorcycle taxis who, once helmets are placed on their heads, transform into zombies and begin to spew money from their mouths as if they had become human ATMs. In Cameroon, rumors abound of zombie laborers toiling on invisible plantations in an obscure nighttime economy. Similar stories of possessed workforces emanate from South Africa and Tanzania, including tales of part-time zombies captured during their sleeping hours only to wake up exhausted after their nocturnal exploitation. While labor is seen as possessed, money too is said to be enchanted. Congolese stories, for instance, tell of bitter dollars secreted within their possessors' homes, whose sudden and uncontrolled growth crushes their entrapped owner. Commodities too partake in these bizarre powers of expansion. Tales flourish in southwestern Congo, for instance, of people being possessed and devoured by diamonds. Similar accounts of extraordinary transactions between money and human bodies thrive in film and video. In Ghana, a popular 1990s video film called Diablo depicts a man who transforms himself into a python, enters a prostitute's vagina, and after metamorphosing, back into human form, collects the banknotes she vomits forth, thereby harnessing female reproductive powers for purposes of economic accumulation. More recently, a widely popular Nigerian video film, Living in Bondage, um, 1992 to 93, which launched Nollywood, today the world's third largest film industry, portrayed a man who acquires riches after sacrificing his wife and drinking her blood. Literally hundreds of video films have followed its path, expanding the immensely popular genre of voodoo horror. All of these examples merely scratch the surface of a rich and expansive popular genre. As much as Nigerian mass culture is a focal point for the dissemination of these images, such folktales emanate with unique local inflections from one part of the African subcontinent to another, telling of credit cards that provide instant commodities without registering debt, of magical coins that turn people into zombies, and of enchanted currencies that leave cash registers and return to their owners after every purchase. Most striking perhaps is the epidemic of stories of dismemberment and murder for the harvesting of body parts that bring riches, either as commodities for sale or as ingredients in magic potions. In Tanzania, for instance, legends proliferate concerning the murder of children whose skins are sold at prices of around $5,000 for occult purposes. And among miners involved in the illicit diamond trade between Angola and Congo, workers maintain that when digging is unsuccessful, it is necessary to sacrifice either male sperm or a body part, a finger or an eye, in order to lift a curse that restricts productivity. Not surprisingly, blood figures prominently in a whole slew of vampire-type stories. In Malawi, in late 2002, in early 2003, for instance, government leaders were widely denounced and occasionally attacked for their alleged participation in a blood theft ring that was purported to trade blood to international agencies in exchange for food aid. While Malawi's president repudiated these accusations, proclaiming that no government can go about sucking the blood of its own people, that's thuggery, 
Such protestations find little traction with people who have seen infant mortality rates soar and life expectancies plummet in an era of globalizing capital. These Malawian tales are instructive for the ways that situate for the ways that they situate human bodies in the vampire-like circuits of international capital. This too is a recurrent feature of recent witchcraft legends. In Cameroon, for example, a host of stories depict local mafias that export zombified labors to Europe. In another set of narratives from Malawi, youths describe airplanes, the essential means of transportation in the age of globalization, which are built from human bones and fueled by human blood, similar occult dialectics of the local and the global are enacted in Ghana, where a young Akin priest promotes his anti-witchcraft shrine by claiming to understand market wars. The better to offer lucrative international opportunities, while another pronounces that the God who possesses me has traveled to London and Frankfurt he can decide the cocoa price if he wishes. As we have seen, perhaps nowhere are legends of enrichment through disembodiment more widespread and compelling than in, than in Nigeria. Popular Yoruba theater, for instance, rehearses stories of child stealers who, after abducting their young prey, trap them in secret rooms and use their blood to make medicines, which in combination with the correct utterances cause money to pour into a calabash set upon the children's heads. In Akin Balu Babarinsa's novel, Anything for Money, a Fulani herdsman in northern Nigeria discovers a metal box containing a human head used for purposes of money magic, money magic. Employed properly, it turns out wads of crisp 20 Nera banknotes but it is in the video industry that such tales have proliferated most promiscuously. Turning out up to 1,500 films annually, Nollywood's most popular genre is juju, or voodoo horror, supernatural thrillers involving spirits, vampires, and ghosts, meant to provide emotionally satisfying explanations for wealth inequalities of injustices that abound in Nigeria. Like all fables of modernity, these legends are more than the stuff of oral culture, literature, vid video, and film. The fears, anxieties, and values that express permeate everyday hold on. The fears, anxieties, and values they express permeate everyday life, defining and shaping social perceptions and political action as much as the domains of folklore, literature, and film. One example may be enough to illustrate this point. That of the Otokoto riots of 1996 in the Nigerian city of Aweri, when rumors of witchcraft sparked a local uprising. The prelude to the riots was the disappearance on September 19th of that year of a young boy, Anthony Ikechukwu Okonkwo, one, in, one of a number of the city's children who had disappeared or been abducted since 1994. Three days later, an employee of the Oweri Atakoto Hotel, Innocent Ikinyanwu, was apprehended transporting the missing boy's head wrapped in plastic in the trunk of a rented car. TV stations widely broadcast clips of the accused abductor holding the boy's head. Within hours of the first reports, hundreds of men gathered in the city's central market and proceeded to attack houses and cars of Oweri's Nouveau Riches, along with three buildings that housed two new breed evangelical churches and one ashram. On September 23rd, the day after his apprehension, innocent Ekin Yanwu died in police custody arousing suspicions he had been murdered to protect his wealthy employers. The next day, police dug up the headless body of the murdered child in the compound of the Atakoto Hotel. A crowd again gathered and commenced to burn the hotel, a nearby department store that catered to the rich, and a number of select stores, 
hotels and businesses connected with 419 men, wealthy speculators whose riches are associated with fraud and corruption. On September 25th, rioting and burning uh, resumed, sparked by the alleged discovery of a roasted human corpse at the residence of one of Awari's young millionaires and of human skulls and human pepper pot soup purportedly found in the Overcomer's Christian Mission, a Christian Mission, a Pentecostal church where the rich man worshipped. The riders also targeted suspected traffickers in human body parts, including Vincent Duru, owner of the Otoko, Otokoto Hotel, who is alleged to have kept a huge cache of body parts in a freezer in his village home. By the time the riots ended, more than 25 buildings and dozens of vehicles had, go had gone up in flames. Several features of these events are especially noteworthy. Not only did the riots target 419 men, the embodiments of illegitimate wealth, they also appear to have been hugely popular. Equally significant, the 11-year-old victim came from a poor family and had been out hawking boiled peanuts for his guardians the day he went missing. The passions incited by his abduction and murder clearly resonated with anxieties about the market as a space that endangers bodily integrity, particularly for the young. Perhaps most instructive is the specific set of exaggerations that animated public accounts of the criminal investigation. Rumors, stories, and media reports widely exaggerated the number of bodies unearthed at a Tokoto uh, Hotel. Newspapers carried reports of 8, 9, 11, and 18 bodies dug up. A front page story in a national daily reported two days after the riots that over 20 human heads have been discovered at various spots in the town by angry demonstrators. One of the more sensational newspapers fled with an article saying that 200 human male organs were found in a goat's belly stored in a freezer in a Tokotos Vincent Duros village house. That the exaggerations should focus on corpses and detached body parts is, I submit, anything but accidental. Moreover, if we care for the truth value of exaggerations, to paraphrase Adorno, then we ought to attend to their deep significance as markers of capitalist modernity, as clues to the texture of everyday life in Nigeria in the age of globalization. We might approach this deep meaning via an apparently unrelated newspaper article published almost a year and a half after the Atakoto riot in which an editorialist with the Post Express Wired writes of Nigeria's largest city. Our major expressways within the city of Lagos have become dumping grounds for corpses, victims of ritual killings. P people are being abducted to make money. While there is wailing and great sorrow in one home over a member of the family that is missing, there is joy and great gladness in some other because the missing man has become a money machine to enrich it. Note here the way in which a human corpse becomes a modern money machine and which ritual killings and disappearances are means of enrichment for the perpetrators. It is as if capital accumulation in Lagos, a dumping ground for corpses, traverses a cadaverous economy. While it is true that sorcery is not explicitly invoked in this editorial, the passage bears all the marks of the current genre of tales of bewitched accumulation. As one commentator on the Atokoto events observes, stories of child kidnappings, ritual killings, trade in body parts and other magical practices form part of a dynamic cultural complex for which witchcraft serves as a crude but widely recognized label. The author continues by reading tales of kidnapping and murder as phenomena that symbolically stand for the violence and polarization that increasingly undergird the structure of inequality in contemporary Nigeria. Yet, this is to radically under-theorize these events. To be sure, these are stories about the violence of inequality and social polarization. But they are stories organized according to specific tropes, which pivot on images of dissection, corporal fragmentation, and disembodiment, 
and the specificities of such imagery require explanation. Consider, as cases in point, the claims for a pepper pot soup full of human body parts that is central to the Atokoto events, or the rumor that 200 human male organs were found in a goat's belly at Vincent Duro's village house. If the popular imagination simply seeks fantastic depictions of inequality, it is not clear why it should turn so persistently to images of dissection, to the chopping up of human bodies. It is precisely this, the persistence of images of corporal fragmentation and, dismem and disembodiment that I seek to scrutinize. There's no doubt that all such imaginings are multivalent, weaving together diverse strands of human experience, histories of race, gender, class, and kinship, memories of slavery, colonialism, and war, experiences of marketized and monetized social relations, the savage consequences of structural adjustment programs, the corruption of post-colonial elites, the devastation wreaked by an AIDS pandemic into coherent local discourses. There is also little doubt that these images have a multitude of local determinations that frequently elude even the most sensitive ethnographer. But pulsating through the multifarious local mo moments of these aesthetics of horror, we find recurring images of accumulation via corporal dismemberment and possession. And it is this strand, these powerful depictions of enrichment through disembodiment, that I wish to explore as explanatory markers of life in late capitalism. I make no claim for the comprehensiveness of this account. It is inherent in the phenomena under investigation that they overflow with localized meanings. But unless we are con content to adopt a cult of the local, unless we are prepared to ignore the general social phenomena at work at the micro level, then it is imperative that we take up the challenge of linking small acts to wider processes, as one analyst of agrarian change in class formation in Africa has put it. Of course, to dialectically locate the global within the local involves recognizing that the macro itself exists only in and through the concrete particulars that compose it. But the reverse is true as well. The particular exists only in and through its interrelations with other particular moments and experiences. Together, these constitute a concrete totality, a rich complex of many determinations and relations, the unity of the diverse. The concepts local and global do not refer, therefore, to actually existing entities or domains of life which the critic must then connect to one another. Even when analytically isolated by the critic, they are always lived together in their dialectical unity. What these terms capture are aspects or moments of the rich, complex, diverse, and many-sided phenomena that constitute everyday life in the age of globalizing capitalism. But because a concrete totality is always internally differentiated, a unity of the diverse, we can tease out that diversity by attending to regional spaces within the world system and the regional imaginaries which, which there arise. Regions are comprised of complex differentiated spaces within the world order, constituted in and through shared histories, distinct patterns of capital accumulation, and unique socio-cultural and class formations. By attending to such regional locations in the capitalist world system, we enter into mediations that constitute the intricate dialectic of the local global. In these, lo in these locations can be sites for distinct kinds of social imaginings about the modern world. Such imaginings may indeed be as old as modernity itself, but the cognitive mappings of the whole that characterize globalizing capitalism of the early 21st century have highly distinct characteristics frequently pivoting on images of possessive money and possessed bodies. It is typical of the cognitive cartography through which we map the space of global capitalism today that they deploy geographical metaphors, south and north being perhaps the two most significant of such spatial similes. While there are dangers in thinking of social relations in strictly spatial terms, among other things, social differences within those spaces can all too easily be elided 
The truth embedded in these terms has to do with the reality of differentiated regional locations within the circuits of global accumulation. So, once we begin to identify regions in these terms, we are compelled to recognize the multiple scales on which they operate. As Henry Lefebvre remarked, social space is always hyper-complex, a combination of distinct, intersecting, overlapping, and contradictory patterns of spatial organization of human life. The space of my community, for instance, is simultaneously a location for the material and social reproduction of individuals living in a diverse set of, house of household units, a site for the global reproduction of capital formed in and through specific regionally organized industries, a space of local and national jurisdictions for, pur for purposes of state administration, a site of multiple languages, English, Cantonese, and Vietnamese predominate in the case of my neighborhood, for example, and cultural practices. When we speak of regions within a world system, then we are referring to locations of specific patterns of life and labor, from infant mortality rates and lifespans to the predominance of resource extraction or informal work. At another level, we are thinking of imaginative spaces for the production of meanings. And as we have seen, however much they mobilize local languages and idioms, Regional imaginaries in the world of modern capitalism also aspire to a regional cartography of global processes in the spheres of cultural uh, or of culture, economy, and politics. One of the reasons that local grammars and vocabularies are so powerfully resonant is that capital, contrary to a too simple picture, does not extinguish the local, however much it works to impose its social logic on pre-existing forms of social life. Despite its absolutizing pretensions, global capitalism operates by systematically reorganizing existing social formations, disarticulating and rearticulating property, labor, authority, gender, sexual norms, family, and community, so as to facilitate the accumulation of capital. Rather than literally invent a world in its image, capitalism exhibits a unique dialectic of incorporation, in which it accommodates the particular at the very moment it absorbs and refashions it. As a result, local cultural idioms are replete with knowledge of the global. Narrating experiences of incorporation into the circuits of capitalism, local idioms subtend the, the cacophonous language of capitalist modernity. Rather than expressing traditional values and meanings outside of modernity, these idioms capture the concrete enactment of the global at the level of lived experience, as well as the counter narratives that probe the prospects for other histories, for social projects outside the logics of global capital. To be sure, all such regional imaginaries are formed through the differences of class, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and more that comprise the dialectic of the local and the global. As a result, circuiting across and between these locations is a network of contested meanings, and the matrix of flows and counterflows of meanings includes narratives from the peripheries, as well as the centers of economic and cultural accumulation. From the start, modernity has been crucially formed in and through the cultural experiences of Africa and the African diaspora. It follows that capitalist modernity is a world process not a merely regional one, however much it unfolds through global hierarchies and subordinations. Indeed, as we shall see shortly, one of the central images of the monstrosity of the market, the zombie, is a product of the African experience that was reworked first in Haiti, then discovered and adapted by Hollywood, only to be transformed again in recent African folktales. In the figure of the zombie laborer, a key marker of modernity, we find traces of global circuits of capital and its others, and of the ways in which the latter imagined a new world of experience. Zombie tales like contemporary witchcraft stories in sub-Saharan Africa are thus fables of modernity. To treat them as such, however, is to challenge the notion that, since modernity disenchants the world by ridding it of spirits, witchcraft tales can only be expressions of traditional or pre-modern values and beliefs in opposition to the norms of modernity. 
Not only does such a view reproduce the colonialist illusion that Africans are prehistorical peoples outside of history, precisely the racialized image mobilized by Hegel, which I shall discuss below. It also ignores the extent to which the emergence of, of modernist notions of space and time had to do intimately with the colonial relation, with the attempt to relate different spatio-temporal orders, such as those encountered in Africa, to that of Europe. Africa and Africans were present at the birth of modernity, however much they are differentially implicated in it. More than this, notions of Africa as a pre-modern space also serve a deeply apologetic and ideological function, placing the enduring production of global, pro global poverty and social exclusion, of global apartheid outside the dynamics of world capitalism. In what follows, I shall insist on reading African witchcraft tales as markers of and challenges to capitalist modernity. In so doing, I have the good fortune of building on some compelling work in critical anthropology, which has insisted that urban witchcraft legends in Africa constitute, as Louise White writes about African vampire stories, new imaginings for new relationships. Drawing upon older imageries, these folk tales endeavor to map the archaeology of the visible and the invisible that characterizes a society governed by the commodity form. As a result, the central preoccupations of these stories register decisive shifts in social experience. To put it baldly, if earlier forms of sorcery dealt predominantly with fissures and fractures among kin, the new occult deals with the life-threatening dangers of an impersonal mania for the accumulation of wealth. Where the older sorcery was wielded by and against family members and neighbors, the new form is typically inflicted on and by strangers. New modalities of witchcraft have thus largely abandoned the economy of the family for that of the market. As a number of commentators have noted, the use of occult power to create laboring zombies appears to be a quite recent and novel innovation within the repertoire of African sorcery. Moreover, so much has the new occult come to inhabit the impersonal sphere of market relations that in some cases witchcraft itself has become a commodity, a power that, no longer inherited or learned, can simply be purchased on the market. Rather than expressions of traditional values in opposition to the forces of capitalist modernity, recent urban discourses of bewitchment in sub-Saharan Africa thus comprise complex, multi-layered readings of the changing circumstances of social life in the age of globalizing capitalism. Certainly, older idioms and orders of meaning are drawn upon in the elaboration of modern cultural semantics, but this is merely to note that meanings are always historical that they do not conform to formalist principles of structural typology, but instead involve never-ending reworkings of earlier modes of social thought and perception accompanied by the incorporation of new idioms of thought and feeling. New ways of imagining thus emerge out of hybrid configurations of old and new, indigenous and foreign systems of meaning. To take a single example, there seems little doubt that new rituals and structures of belief regarding witchcraft accompanied the incorporation of rural African communities into colonial capitalist labor markets. While employing older idioms, novel and urgent problems of social life demanded new discursive forms, new grammars of experience. My concern here is with a recent genre of urban African witchcraft tales, one that speaks to the occult economies of globalizing capitalism. These stories emerge according to unique patterns during the last quarter of the 20th century, the classic era of globalization, and persist into the new one as a principally urban genre. They take root in a soil in which older kinship patterns and forms of rural economy have been significantly eroded. They flourish in the increasingly anonymous and commodified spaces of large cities. While they are preceded by other semantic shifts in the folklore of witchcraft, particularly alterations that occur in the period between the world wars, there is something highly distinctive about the way these tales articulate troubling relations involving money, 
global markets, zombie labor, and human body parts. At its heart, this genre of witchcraft stories seeks to apprehend and evaluate the social practices and social ontology of capitalism, the acquisitive, cumulative, individualist modes of behavior, and the unique processes of abstraction and disembodiment characteristic of an economy organized by value relations and money. At the same time, it also registers semantic shifts that highlight the intensification of commodified relations and the growing financialization of contemporary capitalism. Kinship and accumulation from the old witchcraft to the new. Before we proceed, a word is needed about terminology. Since Western constructions of African witchcraft have been deeply inscribed by colonialist imaginings of the primitive, it is tempting simply to forsake the term. This temptation is heightened by the fact that Western sensibility typically identifies witchcraft with evil, thereby obscuring its much more fluid meanings in many African contexts. The local words translated as witchcraft or sorcellerie in French do not carry a universally perjurative charge. In many African cultures, the terms employed refer to extraordinary powers that can be used for either social or antisocial purposes. In addition to this linguistic complication, matters are made worse by the long Western history of exoticizing African peoples by reference to witchcraft. Constructing witchcraft beliefs as primitive and irrational, Western commentators have treated Africans as curious objects of amusement or of study by academic tourists from the global north. Notwithstanding these reservations in tandem with some of the best work in critical anthropology, I will, I will retain the term in large measure because this is the language Africans themselves employ to describe occult powers. But more than the issue of terminology, it is the question of meaning that is crucial. For newer urban grammars of witchcraft in sub-Saharan Africa capture something lost in the Komodo normative discourses of the West, a sense of the genuinely monstrous dynamics of a society subordinated to the commodity form. Turn back on the developed centers of world capitalism, as well as critically deployed at home, African vampire tales carry a powerful de-fetishizing charge, one that denaturalizes commodified relations by presenting them as both bizarre and mysterious. Turning now to the semantic shifts within African witchcraft tales in the age of globalization, let us begin with an overview of earlier genres. And here, some qualifications are in order. There's no way of knowing what these practices and discourses looked like before they became objects of study and analysis, a process inseparable from Western contact and colonization. The travel histories, memoirs of Christian missionaries and colonial officials, and early work in Western anthropology from which the first accounts of African witchcraft are drawn were bound up with historical processes that dramatically transformed many aspects of African social life. More than this, in a common dialectic of, modern, of modernity, Africans borrowed bits and pieces from Western religions, cosmologies, and narratives in order to make sense of new structures of experience, many of them formed in and through colonial relations. What we get from these early literatures then are particular descriptions of African practices as they appeared to usually ethnocentric outsiders in the flux of colonial encounters. Yet these literatures can be and have been read against the grain in order to cull real and sometimes subversive knowledge from these sources, not only about the biases and blindness of their authors, but also about aspects of African cultural practices. Such readings can be especially instructive where they mesh with later works in critical ethnography and anthropology. Drawing on such work, older witchcraft idioms rooted in rural communities organized around family farming appear to have focused on the threats posed by private accumulation to the unity and solidarity of kin groups and wider communities. Consequently, African communities typically mobilized ethics of reciprocity and redistribution to counter the solvent force of individual accumulation. 
To be sure, relations of reciprocity were entangled with exploitation and inequality. Nevertheless, such modes of exploitation did not rest on notions of unfettered individual accumulation. In fact, inequality and exploitation were frequently hemmed in by social ethics that discouraged, indeed pathologized, excessive accumulation. For the Igbo in rural communities in Nigeria, for example, wealth that is stored up without being redistributed is regarded as highly dangerous since it creates an unhealthy psychic heat that can lead to death and disaster. Heat generated by individual accumulation can only be relieved, cooled, it is said, through the redistributive practices of healthy communal life. The witch who seeks to accumulate is accordingly perceived as an introvert, one whose inwardness involves turning away from the social group. An enclosed self is thus inherently dangerous, since possessive individuals separate themselves off as private accumulators, thereby disavowing communal obligations. Many African societies thus counterposed private accumulation to social unity, picturing them as fundamentally antagonistic forces. In this worldview, witches are internal threats to social cohesion, not ominous outsiders. Even when their precise identities are unknown, it is taken as given that witches are members of the local community, people disposed to attack their neighbors and relatives. This stark counterposition between selfish acquisition and communal obligations also explains why many African societies saw the peculiar obsession of white colonialists with personal riches as signaling their incapacity for kinship. This sensibility is captured beautifully in a proverb associated with the Tsonga of the Transvaal um, Yo Yoveld? Loveld? White people have no kin nation. Their kin nation is money. To use the terminology developed by Karl Polanyi, which is not without its difficulties, most, Af most African societies, like non-capitalist societies elsewhere, embedded economic relations within a larger communal ethos and social rituals corresponding to it that governed social life. Rather than an, in an independent force that could be counted on to regulate itself, as in market ideology, individual economic behavior was ordered according to social ethical norms. For most African societies, the disembedding of economics, the privileging of the forces of private accumulation as ends in themselves, represented an unleashing of demonic energies that, by rupturing the social fabric, turned kin against kin and stimulated an orgy of violent individualism in which people would, would literally devour others. Like many non-capitalist moral economies elsewhere, which are today reconfigured in contradictory relations with capitalist forms of life, those in Africa have typically seen the economic cosmos in zero-sum terms. Since wealth and resources are finite, one person's gain is another's loss. So when witches disrupt the balance of things by engaging in non-communal appropriation, they invariably hurt others. In the idiom of the Ihan Zoo of North Central Tanzania, what the witch gains, others lose. Witches thus consume the sources of life itself, rather than recirculate re them. Among the Igbo of Nigeria, the witch is an improper accumulator, an eater of blood rather than a redistributor of wealth. She attempts to gain control over what should be communal wealth in order to enrich and prolong her, indiv her individual life. The witchcraft of personal acquisition, which co coexists, as we shall see, with the witchcraft of leveling, clearly expresses a powerful ambivalence. On the one hand, people fear the destructive forces of unfettered personal acquisition, while on the other hand, they often desire more personal wealth and resent the redistributive duties required of them. This frequently involves a dualistic perspective of the sort one finds among the people of the Bamenda grasslands in Cameroon, for whom the zero-sum economy of everyday life contrasts with the invisible, enchanted, and beautiful world of Mza, accessible only to cunning individuals. 
Mazar is a realm. Well, okay, hold on. Mazar, I am definitely pronouncing incorrectly. Forgive me. Mazar is a realm of abundance and infinite rather than zero sum possibilities. Organized as a market in which the only currency is human beings, it is populated by devils, pure possessive individualists, and accumulators who respect no social obligations and obey no codes of reciprocity. Such notions of bewitched transactions in invisible markets have long been common to many African witchcraft discourses, as have ideas of humans as currency, and both notions have been reworked in more recent idioms. In Ghana today, traders associated with Pentecostalist churches sometimes imagine that, alongside the visible one, there's also an invisible market in which dealings are conducted in meat taken spiritually from humans who are eventually eaten up by witches until they become sick or die. Whatever the attractions of individual acquisition then, it is viewed as both a threat to others and a source of potential self-destruction. As a caution about the dangers involved, many older grammars of witchcraft warn that private accumulation elicits the rage which is feel toward display, displays of wealth. Among the Ibibio of Nigeria, witches are portrayed as jealous levelers intent on harming those who accumulate and exhibit wealth. Similarly, in the folklore of the Ihan Zoo of north central Tanzania, Modern witches dislike development, progress, and modernity, and are inclined to destroy wealth. They too are leveling enforcers of nightmare egalitarianism. Not only do redistributive practices, such as potlatch ceremonies, preserve group solidarity, by reducing accumulated wealth, they protect the relatively prosperous individual from grievous attacks by sorcerers. Yet, as if to remind us of the ambivalence involved, of the way in which personal enrichment is something both illicit and desired, witches are also said to be greedy. Among the Ihan Zhu, a predominantly agricultural people grappling with increasing commercialization, witches have typically been those who reap wealth disproportionate to their land and labor. Thus, as much as witchcraft represents a warning about the harm that may come to those who seek personal wealth, it also expresses a powerful, if illicit, longing for magical accumulation, for acquisition and enjoyment of riches without the performance of arduous labor. The more fully people are inserted into capitalist relations, the more intense this ambivalence towards individual enrichment seems to become. As much as individuals might disavow personal accumulation, after all, the imperatives of capitalism reward it. For peasants in systems of rural farming, commodification dictates that production for the market and maximization of income are the keys to the survival of the family farm, yet deep tensions are involved in resorting to market logics to preserve domestic farming. In Niger, for instance, many Maori parents send their sons off as migrant laborers in hopes that their earnings might sustain the family economy. In so doing, however, parents sever the kin unit in order to preserve it. The family thereby undergoes a sort of amputation, a dissection which often foreshadows its death, particularly when children do not return. The monstrosities of the market manifest themselves here in a wrenchingly ominous form, as children are sent into the labor market in an effort to preserve the family unit. They are frequently devoured by it, disappearing from the lives of their kin. It comes as little surprise that tales of death and dismemberment figure prominently in the rumors of bewitchment that haunt the Maori imagination. If capitalist markets disrupt kinship relations, they are also held to distort the biology of human reproduction. Since hoarding is conceived as obstructing the natural flow of wealth, its perpetual circulation throughout local society, it is viewed as blocking up the sources of life. Indeed, sorcerers are often said to appropriate the energy, energies of human bioreproduction for purposes of private acquisition. This too resonates with the notion of a zero-sum universe. If wealth is to be augmented and accumulated in, unnat in unnatural and antisocial ways, 
This can only occur through the appropriation of reproductive energies from the domain to which they properly belong, human procreation. Thus, while witches sometimes kill, their greed also drives them to steal the reproductive powers of others, or to divert their own. The case of the West African Mammy Wada, or Mammy Water, intriguing hybrid creations is instructive in this regard. Mermaid-like creatures that seduce humans into becoming their spouses. The Mammy Wada endow their human partners with riches derived from the ocean floor if they renounce human marriage and reproduction. The sexuality of Mammy Wada and their spouses is thus redirected from biological reproduction to the production of wealth. By diverting reproductive energies into the dangerous and sterile process of individual acquisition of money and commodities, the witchcraft of accumulation undermines female biological reproduction. Yet, where women are concerned, this raises profound contradictions. After all, while threatening their normal socio-cultural role in a patriarchal society, witchcraft also opens the possibility that women might pursue both sex and wealth for individual purposes rather than for the reproduction of the community. Eh. As women enter capitalist markets in greater numbers, one frequently encounters throughout Africa resting imagery haunted by the idea of monstrous female sexuality run amok. Um, in Nigeria, for example, young female witches are said to manifest overwhelming sexuality and satanic avarice. In southern Niger, people warn of female spirits known as Marius, married women whose insatiable appetite for sex and candy leads them to prostitution, and who are said to often harm and occasionally kill the objects of their seduction. Commodification of social life thus activates fear that market society can wickedly empower women who symbolically castrate and emasculate men. But we are now straying into discussion of the new witchcraft of market accumulation. Before proceeding further in this direction, let me briefly summarize. Let me briefly summarize. The older languages of witchcraft posited, posited as we have seen, a zero-sum economy threatened by the personal greed of antisocial spirits. The envy of witches, both their unnatural passion for acquisition and their hostility to the accumulative, accumulative practices of others, announced itself in attacks on neighbors and kin. Quite often, this was seen, and sometimes still is, as involving the appropriation of human procreative energies for, pur for purposes of accumulation. While providing gripping images of greed and possessive individualism, these languages of witchcraft have been unable to account for many novel features of globalizing capitalism. As a result, discourses of sorcery have been reworked in remarkably inventive ways, particularly in urban sub-Saharan Africa, where the impact of global capitalism has been especially devastating.